Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thanks for joining us on uh, this Wednesday uh, for yet another weekly workshop at Pitt's Theology Library. My name is Brady Beard. I'm the Reference and Instruction Librarian at Pitt's, and today I'm joined by my colleague Anne-Marie McLean, the Reference Librarian and Outreach Coordinator at Pitt's Library. And we want to spend a little bit of time just chatting with you about uh, what to do with all the information that you'll come across as a student at Candler, but also the information that you come across online through social media and all sorts of other uh, news uh, media and news sources online. We know that there's a lot of info out there, some of it more accurate than others. And so today we're going to be talking about specific skills that you can employ uh, to decipher, analyze, and synthesize information out in the world. We know that one of the biggest struggles today is finding reliable and accurate information. As we talk today, it will be really good for us to sort of have a baseline definition of what information is. And by information, I mean sort of the big picture of information. This can be something new that you heard in a class at Candler or a perspective that a student, fellow student, or perhaps a professor brings to, uh, to the class. But as I mentioned earlier, Information can also refer to the sorts of things that we come across on social media or the other news media. Uh, so information today means this sort of broad spectrum of the sorts of things that we'll come across in our formal education, but also in uh, the everyday uh, experiences that we have. Within the last few years, we've probably all become accustomed to the contested arena of information and knowledge. We've heard about fake news and alternative facts. We've come across arguments about who counts as an expert on any given topic and whether or not we should even trust the experts. So two major questions are sort of up for grabs. Those questions are, how can we find information and what information can we trust? So just take a moment to reflect on where you find information in your day-to-day -day life. Think about the passive and the active ways that you take in information. Do you search out uh, something new or do you just stumble across it on social media or in class? Do you use sources that are primarily accessible from wherever you are in the world or do you primarily use databases and resources connected to a library like Pitt's library or maybe a public library? So thinking about how we access information and where we access information are really two of the big questions that we should be thinking about when it comes to thinking about deciphering, analyzing, and synthesizing information. So let's take a quick look at an example. Uh, Here's an example from a fairly recent headline from an online news organization. And as we read this headline, think about what the author might uh, have, why the author might have written the headline this way. What are the implications of this headline? What can you start to gather about the argument that the author might uh, be using in the essay if you were to click this link and follow it? You can already start to gather some information about this headline just by asking these questions. Uh, you might notice that the authors of this piece have incorporated a quote within the headline. That quote is, of course, I wish we taught more in our schools about the Islamic faith. How does this quote relate to the rest of the headline and what purpose um, could it serve for the author's intention? So already in this one example, we've started to think about a number of issues that I hope this webinar will help us to address. We're noticing that in order to understand information, we have to do more than just consume it. We have to engage it and ask questions about it. We have, um, we've asked some questions about the author's motivation and at least started to think of what the implications of the author's um, style and tone might be. 
we've started to explore other ways that the same information could have been conveyed or even asked what information is left out. And we've poked around at the underlying argument of the headline and started to ask the uh, questions about it and its assumptions. So the main assumption of today's webinar is that we can take these sorts of steps with any information that we come across. Now, if you're like me, uh, I guess that you probably already have a process for doing further research when you come across new information. That might look like discussing the topic with a trusted friend or mentor or family members. Uh, you might go so far as to ask questions about the tone of the piece and the author who wrote it. You might do a little researching into the publication. Where was this information published? Was it in a general website, a news website, somebody's blog post, a scholarly book? You might start uh, even asking questions about the argument. How convincing is the author when they present this new information? You might take it one step further. You might uh, test the information of against uh, resources that you find in an institutional database, or you might read more about it on the internet, whether on a blog or a website or uh, other resource dedicated to the topic. These are all great steps, and these are things that most of us probably do uh, all the time. Anytime we're confronted with new information, we probably do at least one, if not more, of these things. So for today, what I want to do is to expand and build on these steps. And I want to do that in a particular way. And I'm going to suggest that um, the habits of mind might be a good way that we can do this. Uh, if you look in the handout section of today's webinar, you will find this PowerPoint there. You are um, more than welcome to download this PowerPoint. Some of the um, elements that I'll be talking about today are hyperlinked in the PowerPoint, and you'll see those hyperlinks and parts of the presentation that are underlined. So if you want to learn more about Habits of Mind, you can download this, uh, this PowerPoint and then click on the link uh, on this slide. But uh, the habit, habits of mind are uh, is sort of a theory about engaging with information and education that Arthur L. Costa developed. And as he writes about the habits of mind, he identifies 16 different skills that we need to become responsible and capable consumers of information. The good news is, is that these 16 skills are probably things that we already do. These are technical skills, attitudes, cues, past experiences, and preferences that we use to solve problems in other areas of our lives. I'm not going to talk about all 16 habits of mind today, but I'm going to talk a briefly about half of them. And these uh, habits you'll see on the screen, they're all sort of interconnected. And so if as I talk this afternoon, you think that boy, uh, gathering data sure sounds like applying past knowledge or remaining open to continuous learning sounds a lot like thinking flexibly. That's okay, because these things are all interconnected. Um, and instead, what I'm going to do is try to outline some steps that you can take when you're faced with new knowledge or new information and talk about them within this framework of the habits of mind. So the steps that I'm going to be talking about today are in the title of this presentation, deciphering, analyzing, and synthesizing. By deciphering, I simply mean that this is the initial stage that we face when we engage with new information or when we start a new research project. This stage often means gathering new data and understanding it. And I'll give you some clues into what that could mean uh, in just a moment. The analyze step is the step where we test out the new information. We take all the stuff that we've gathered and we start to think critically about it. Uh, we evaluate its effectiveness, its accuracy, and its usefulness. The last step, synthesizing this information, is where we begin to bring the information into previous knowledge that we have from past experiences, and we incorporate it into our lives in some way. This is the hard work of reframing what we previously knew and incorporating that new information and embarking on uh, 
the process all over again. So it's really a cyclical process. Every time we're faced with new information, we take these steps and the process starts all over. Like I said, the 16 habits of mind that Costa talks about are interconnected and they depend on one another. So as we go along, if some of the things sound really similar to some of the other things that we've talked about, that's okay. We're just talking about a framework uh, for one way of thinking about engaging new information before us. So let's talk about that first step, the deciphering step. This is the most, um, this is one of the most important steps of engaging with new information. And when we engage new information, we have a few skills at our disposal that we can start to employ. So think about this scenario. You're sitting in class and your professor says something in a lecture that you had never considered before. Or maybe alternatively, you're just surfing around on the internet, you're poking around on social media, and you see a, a news article or a blog post that contains new information that you had never considered before. This is the moment that we're talking about. This is the initial step of the decipher stage. To move through this stage, we have to take this new knowledge and begin to incorporate it. So the first thing that we might do is to gather more data on the topic. In order to understand a problem or a subject, we often have to experience it fully. It's sort of like eating a new food. If you just listen to the way other people describe uh, this wonderful new food, you don't actually get to experience it yourself. And so gathering information is the step that you take to actually participate in the process of understanding new information. By gathering data, you uh, take the hard work of sort of taking an idea and distilling it down to its core and then using that to search for other relevant information around that topic. This can help us to slow down and to resist making a snap judgment about whether someone else's perspective is right or wrong, and we can also keep our own biases and judgments in check. Gathering data means that we have to know where to look to find relevant information, and I'll return to this topic in just a minute. Gathering data, though, means that we're probably going to have to persist through the whole process. Uh, if you've ever used a library catalog or done a research project, you know that finding new information can often be a bit of a slog. And so persisting is a sort of mindfulness that allows us to uh, continue the process even when we are faced with a challenge or we come up against a dead end uh, on the research process. This is um, sort of having a singular focus in mind uh, and resisting the urge to follow every single rabbit trail that might come down, the, uh, that might come toward us. So as we gather new information on a topic, um, you might run into a paywall, for instance. Uh, if you've ever tried to read uh, news articles in, uh, in a journal or newspaper that you don't have subscription to, you know that you're often limited by uh, a certain number of articles that you can read in a particular month. So persistence means continuing to look for information even in the face of a paywall. Or you might not be getting the results that you're looking for in the library catalog or in a library database. And persistence means continuing to do the search even if the answer isn't immediately available or immediately apparent. All of this to say that incorporating new knowledge takes time and take some patience. The third step is related to this idea of persistence, and that is to think flexibly. One way that we can continue in our process and that we can persist even in the face of uh, paywalls or unsuccessful catalog searches is by being flexible. We can change our approach or we can shift our topic or even use a thesaurus or subject headings or other resources available to us to change our keyword searches. So as we gather new data and we start to think about the new data, we might have to adjust our own assumptions and our own rules about what information uh, is out there. And sometimes even we might have to re rephrase or rethink what exactly we mean or what we're interested in in the research process as we gather new information. 
So here are a few tips to persisting and being flexible. Make sure that you're using the right database. Uh, remember that databases aren't entirely neutral. They are designed by people like you and I with specific algorithms and purposes in mind. So every database, yes, even Google, is going to have its own way of thinking and its own way of returning results. Um, beyond that, you want to make sure that you're looking in the right place. For instance, you probably wouldn't be looking for an article on uh, medical ethics necessarily in a journal devoted entirely to the subject of ancient Near Eastern religions, right? So you want to be thinking about using the right database to find the data that you're looking for. How does the database match up with the information that you need? Secondly, keep at it. Remember that every search attempt can help improve your next search. So even if you don't get the results that you're looking for the first time, don't get discouraged. Be flexible, be persistent, and improve your next search based on what you learned the first time. And then be adaptable. Adjust your keywords, adjust the database, and even adjust your question or what you're thinking about the information to help get at a new uh, valuable uh, search return that will actually be useful to you. Now, we've sort of taken the first step to decipher and gather information. We've done the early part of getting all the information that we need in front of us. Now it's time to analyze that information. So once you've begun to decipher the information and you've figured out what is relevant to the question at hand, you can take some steps to begin to think about that uh, information more formally. My suggestion today is that you can use these three skills, listening with understanding, thinking interdependently, and questioning and problem posing to help you analyze materials. Listening with understanding is really the first step towards seeing the problem or the argument as other people see it. This is really the basic step of trying to hear what the author or the writer is saying rather than what you think they are saying. This is often a very sort of difficult step to take because we bring with us all of the experiences and past knowledge every time we start a new research project or every time we engage new information. And uh, developing an empathetic ear can help us to see what others are actually trying to say rather than arguing with what we think they are trying to say. So listening or reading with understanding means taking an empathetic approach toward a new argument or new information and carefully discerning the author or the speaker's argument. For those of you who might be familiar with biblical studies, or maybe you're taking um, OT501 or NT501 at Candler this year, the steps toward listening with understanding are not unlike exegesis. It's an attempt to hear someone else rather than to hear what we think they are saying. It's an opportunity for us to test how well we are listening or how closely we are uh, reading them versus what we think they might be saying or what they might be writing. A good way to test if you are listening with understanding is to try to paraphrase someone else's argument, to build on it. You can ask for clarification, particularly if you're faced with new information in, in a classroom setting. Or you can even try to formulate an example that uh, might relate to what the person is saying or writing. Listening with understanding doesn't mean that you'll agree with the information or the argument, but you'll be more certain that you heard it well as you begin to further analyze the, the information. Thinking interdependently means uh, that we realize that we don't come to our conclusions on our own, but we are always incorporating the voices of others. When it comes to engaging with new information, this can mean testing that information against other research on the topic, or testing the conclusion within a specific community, or even looking for a consensus or finding corroborating voices on a topic. Uh, this is a 
step beyond simply looking for sort of peer review or the scholarly perspective on a topic. It means to take a broad look at uh, data and information and to connect it to other elements or other things that you might know or that communities might know in order to understand it better. Questioning and problem posing means approaching new information with more questions and not necessarily with more arguments. So as you hear something new for the first time or as you read something new for the first time, ask questions about what data is needed for the argument uh, or the uh, assumption to be true. What evidence would make someone else's argument false? Can you uh, think about ways that you might have made the argument that the author is making without using the data that they are? What evidence did the, uh, the author or the speaker leave out? What did they ignore or what did they emphasize? Good questions that you can ask are, what evidence is there for blank? Or how reliable is the data set? Or even, what is the alternative solution to the problem? So as you analyze, it's important that you listen, think, and test. Consider why an individual would say or write uh, what they did on that particular platform. How does the author or speaker relate to the content? How else could they have said it? What evidence did they need? What evidence did they use? What could they have left out? Or what could they have added to have been more convincing? You'll also want to consider your sources during the analyze step. And this means moving beyond peer review. Peer review uh, means different things in different disciplines. Peer review does not often mean in the humanities that something is true or factual. It means that the author, the scholar behind the peer review study has done the work to put his or her particular question within the confines of a larger scholarly commu uh, community and conversation. Uh, and so peer review is not the end all be all to testing information. Uh, I'll also say that neither is, uh, you know, identifying bias a simple solution to adjudicating whether or not a source is good or bad. Instead, you'll want to be asking lots of questions around the source that you are talking about. This can mean asking questions about who profits from the information that's available out there. Um, information has value. This is often why uh, scholarly journals, scholarly journals or even news articles are behind paywalls, that they are valuable. Uh, the mode of presentation can be a good clue as to what type of source that you're, you're using. Uh, how has the uh, source or the article been received within the larger sort of context? And who else can corroborate or collaborate uh, with that information? Uh, again, this is sort of moving beyond just thinking about peer review as an end-all be-all, but asking lots of questions around that particular uh, source. Once you've analyzed all the sorts of, once you've done the work of analyzing the sources that you're using, you'll want to take steps towards synthesizing that data. And to synthesize the data, you can really do three things. The first is to apply past knowledge. None of us learn from scratch. We're always bringing in our past experiences and our past knowledge um, into the research process. And every time we engage with new information, we can test it against what we know or um, what we uh, bring with us, the experiences that we have. This doesn't mean, of course, that we will always be right. In fact, far from it. It means that uh, our own experiences and knowledge might have to be filtered through this new information that we're learning. So don't make the mistake of thinking that you have to start um, from 
from scratch every time and that you can't learn from the past. Instead, approach every new uh, topic or every new instance of new information with that enormous toolkit that you have from your own life experiences and your own educational background. Synthesizing information also means learning continuously. Knowledge often changes. In fact, the whole point of scholarship is to push the bounds of what we as human beings know. And as we push those boundaries, we have to adjust our previous knowledge in order to fit with the new information. Here's a really good example of what that can look like. One of the biggest conversations in the news and on social media earlier this year had to do with the coronavirus and COVID-19. As we learned more about this virus, because it was a new virus, we were constantly learning more about it. But as we knew more about it, our responses uh, societally, culturally, and what we were hearing from scientists uh, and organizations like the CDC or the World Health Organization, those uh, guidelines were sort of shifting. That was really frustrating for all of us because there for a little while, it felt like we didn't know what to believe. The point of this example, though, is that as we learned more information about this new thing that was occurring, we were able to adjust and adapt. And so as our knowledge changes, so should we. And then finally, you'll want to think about thinking. Reflect on the experience of gathering that new data or engaging with that new knowledge. Think about the process and employ it the next time you're faced with new information. Uh, the whole uh, reason to synthesize information is so that the next time around, you'll be more adept and more able to incorporate uh, the new data or the new information and you'll become better about thinking about how to do that and the steps that you should take uh, as you move forward. So two things are really important on the synthesizing step. The first is to incorporate your knowledge into your previous uh, frameworks. This can mean uh, a couple of different things. First, it can mean that you'll want to develop a way to track your research using a method that works for you. You can, of course, use uh, whatever systems you have available to keep track of what you're reading and what you're learning. But some good free tools that are available to you include Zotero, Google Drive. Um, if you're connected to a learning institution, you often have access to a cloud storage system. And so use those things to save what you're learning so that you um, you have it at your disposal the next time around. The purpose of this, of course, is so that you're able to bring new information into conversation with previous knowledge and past experiences. New information is no good if it can't be synthesized into uh, an, uh, an old framework. And then finally, take the time to reflect and to think about your own thinking, but to reflect on the types of arguments that you came across as you embarked on this search for new data. Uh, recognize, learn to recognize weak arguments from strong arguments by asking all of those questions that I talked about a little while ago. What evidence could have been used? How would I have made this argument? Um, coming up with examples that the author that might support the author's claim. Uh, this is really the work of thinking about thinking, and it can be a really fruitful way of engaging new information and new data. Finally, of course, um, and perhaps most importantly for those of us uh, connected to Pitt's Theology Library, is that we want to be the community that you can sort of do this sort of work in and that you can engage as you uh, learn new things, whether in the classroom or on social media or by reading the news or wherever you might be. Please feel free to reach out to one of the reference librarians if you have questions or you need help on the research process. We are always available to schedule a research consultation. You can email us at theologyref at emory.edu or you can chat with us by using the Ask a Librarian feature at the library's website. 
Like I've said before, we are here to help you with every step of the research process, whether it's hearing something new and wanting to learn more about it, organizing your research, starting out on the research process and looking for new um, data and materials to include, all the way to the end to uh, finding a understanding citation and footnote systems. Uh, we're here to help. So uh, with that, I will end for us today and um, look forward to hearing from you and hearing any of the questions that you might have uh, as you continue to learn and grow every day. Thanks for joining us. Bye-bye.